Com. I am Alfred Okonse. Tonight, the Ghana Police Service under severe criticism for their handling of the arrest of the Democracy Hub protesters. Well, the amnesty national and Center for Democratic Development statement from these two institutions here on your election command center. The Electoral Commission of Ghana has mounted a fierce defense against calls for a forensic audit of the voters' register, explaining that discrepancies in the register can be resolved by existing legal and administrative processes. The commission has been responding to the NDC's petition and asking for a forensic audit by the Electoral Commission. Stay with us, we'll get into the details of it. The NDC director, deputy director of legal, also, and also IT and elections, joining us here on your election command centre. And lots of concerns, questions raised. The electricity company of Ghana gets an interim managing director barely 24 hours after the resignation of Samuel Jubik Mahama as board chair of the ECG. Rejects calls for the dissolution of the board. We'll tell you why this board chair does not believe or agree that the board, the entire board, has to go. As always, you're an integral part of the conversation. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and on X. Let's get talking. Well, let's settle for one of these. Leading member of Democracy Hub, Oliver Bakavomeo, together with 12 other protesters who took part in the demonstration against Kalamse from September 21 to September 23, have been remanded into police custody for two weeks. The three-day Stop Kalamse Now demo was riddled with chaos and drama, leading to several arrests which has since generated a public uproar. I'm really shocked that the Leonard Child had remanded them. I'm shocked. There's a case that's not a by remand. The police didn't make a good case for a remand. I see, you read Oko versus the Republic, the face of Killer J, you read the decision of Oko versus the Republic, they say, yes, the law is alive. In this particular case, what I'm witnessing for, I don't think a good case was made for a remand. As the judge himself uh, accepted, quite a number of the offenses are misdemeanor. The Electoral Commission, EC, has once again dismissed calls by the National Democratic Congress, NDC, for a forensic audit of the Provisional Voters Register, PVR. According to the EC, the legal and administrative mechanisms established to clean the register have not been fully utilized, making a forensic audit unnecessary at the stage. This response was conveyed in a letter addressed to NDC Chairman Johnson Esiedun Ketia following a petition submitted by the party after its demonstration on Tuesday. Day, September 17, 2024. Meanwhile, Deputy Chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Dr. Bosman Sari, says the Commission's response to the NDC is comprehensive, thorough, and justified. He was speaking in a soon to air episode of Hot Issues with Kemini Amano. When you look at Regulations 23 and Regulations 24, both two regulations provide a proper framework for auditing the voters' register. And those processes have not been exhausted. So as a commission, we know that it is what the law allows. So we need to use that to be able to ensure that we have a register that is clean, that is robust, that is credible for the 2024 general election. Board Chair of the Electricity Company of Ghana, Alexander Fenyomakin, has rejected calls for the resignation of the board, insisting it is a new board. Speaking to the media, he said ECG remains committed to ensuring reforms to improve the financial position of the company following the resignation of Managing Director Samuel Dubik Mahama. This is the first meeting of the board, so I think that that's a misplaced position taken by him. However, I accept the fact that we must place our shoulders to the wheel for reforms. I mean, from outside and coming in, I think that ECG can be very efficient if we subject ourselves to reforms. And reform would involve engaging all stakeholders internally and communicating these to the external stakeholders. 
The mortuary workers have temporarily suspended their strike, which left some families stranded for not getting access to corpses of their deceased relatives. They have given government up to October 9 to address their demands in full to prevent an escalation. Some financial clearance for our members or some of the mortuary workers or other recruitment to support our staff strength. It is not the government meeting which is triggering this suspension. It is the fact that Ghanaians are requesting and are begging. We are giving government from today up to 9th of October. If they do not address those issues that we have positively presented to their outfit, then we shall trigger that same strike that we are ending now. We will trigger that strike and to further notice. It is a tense situation in Paga as soldiers are deployed to help you with a four-day vehicular traffic congestion involving nearly 500 cargo trucks. The cause of the congestion is still not known, but its persistence has triggered worry among residents who are raising safety concerns following a number of accidents. Local authorities who are working to ease the situation have called in the military to help ease the situation. Gerard Atwaje is the direct chief executive of Kasana Nankana West in the Upper East region. As of now, uh, things are normal. We've been able to move some of the trucks across, but those that are still at the back, we ask that for a parking place, they should move to the airstrip so that we can control and then move them bit by bit. Because this is the only home we have, Kassana and Kana West, for that matter, Paga. So we cannot uh, sit aloof and let our town catch fire. When it happened that way, we have no place to go. So we need to protect our homes. Before the Black Stars ever soared on the global stage, they were guided by legends who wore the national colors with unmatched passion and pride. These icons carry the hopes of millions, leaving a legacy urged in the hearts of Guineans. But today, as the team prepares for its next chapter, questions are being raised about whether that same passion and dedication still burns bright. There is more in this report. Yes, who comes to the national team, they have to be committed because you have 30-something million population. They have selected 23 and you are part of it. It's an honor. And you have to know that you are representing Ghana. So whatever you have to do to make it work, you have to. Well, this morning is on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next... With many your election command center, the Electoral Commission has provided a detailed response to the NDC's petition for a forensic audit of the voters' register. We'll let you in on the details and hear from the NDC with respect to this response from the Electoral Commission. In fact, so it was a nine-page response to the NDC. We're going to detail the very important aspects of that that statement that came through from the electoral commission earlier today the entire nine pages but this is your election command center well the electoral commission has once again dismissed those calls by the ndc for a forensic audit of the provisional voters register that was exhibited according to the ec the legal and administrative mechanisms established to clean the register have not been fully utilized, making a forensic audit an unnecessary exercise at this stage. Now, this response was conveyed in the letter, which we have a copy of, addressed to the NDC chair, Johnson Isidun Ketia, following this petition submitted by the party after its demonstration on Tuesday, September 17. You recall yesterday, the, the party wrote to the Electoral Commission reminding them that they were waiting for a response to their petition. Well, they have it now. We've got the details of it. Dennis Poberi Wadam is joining me with aspects of this nine-page response by the Electoral Commission. What are they saying? Okay, so let's start from where the NDC put the, the petition before the Electoral Commission. Mm -hmm. This was on the 17th of September, after the demonstration. And largely their concerns were to the effect that they wanted an, a, a permit of an independent forensic audit of the voters register and the IT system. I emphasize on IT system because in one of the response, the key pointers today that the EC responded to was about the integrity of the IT system. Mm -hmm. They also talked about convening stakeholder, stakeholders for collaboration. They wanted to agree to publish the findings of the forensic audit if that permit was given, and also to re-exhibit re the voters register after the audit. 
this is also a matter that the EC has been speaking to today. Mm -hmm. The NDC in that petition also wanted a review so that all errors will be corrected and all unauthorized transfers uh, be taken out. They also wanted to adopt a revised timeline for electoral activities. Mind you, the EC has published a timeline that they've been running with. So the NDC uh, in that petition was seeking to have that timeline revised and also to institute an accountability and integrity um, measures as part of the processes. Now, after the NDC wrote to the EC yesterday to remind them um, of their petition, the EC today gave a comprehensive response to the NDC and in parts of it, they listed the items one after the other and addressed them head on. One of the key things that the EC responded to was um, a claim by the NDC that they had failed to provide the provisional voters register in time for scrutiny. Mm -hmm. But we here on Ghana tonight have spoken extensively to the NDC even before the voter exhibition exercise. And even two days to the exhibition exercise, the NDC had said that they did not have the provisional voters register to look into it before the exhibition exercise. The EC in part admits that indeed they did not give the voters, the provisional voters register to the NDC in good time. However, their argument is that that did not affect the ability of the NDC to have been able to scrutinize the register. So that you would find they provided the day which they gave the provisional register to the NDC, but they are saying that the commission's inability to provide the provisional voters register earlier did not prevent any political party, the NDC inclusive, from scrutinizing the provisional voters register. One of the things that they've also been addressing has to do with the claims by the NDC that discrepancies, there are discrepancies in the voter transfer. This has to do with some over 243,000 transfers that the NDC said they were done illegally. Mm -hmm. Now, the, con the argument of the NDC is that these transfers were done without the consent of the voters. Mm -hmm. The EC says that as far as they are concerned, those transfers were legal, except that when they were given the, the provisional voters register to the parties, they inadvertently included transfers that happened in 2020, 2023, and that saw the number shooting up to the over 243,000 voters that the NDC is complaining about. So yes, they admit that the number in question was very high because of that inadvertence on their part. Now they also talk about unidentifiable um, missing voter data. They say that they want to state categorically that that alleged missing voter have not been deleted and that it is still on their system and can be traced. It's either on the exemption list, I mean the exceptions list, or in multiple lists or transfer lists. So in essence, what they are saying is that it is in the system, it has not been deleted, except that it is in some parts of their system. Let me quickly show you what they said about the integrity of the IT system. Mm -hmm. And this is key. The EC says that they are confident with the system that they have. However, they admit that there is no perfect system. In this case, they've been able to see that it is this same system that has helped them to identify that some transfers that were done in Pusiga, mm -hmm. they were able to identify the person and how the transfer were done, and they used the same system to track and reverse those um, transfers. Right. So as far as they are concerned, the system has a, an audit trail, and that tracks all entries and modifications. So they have confidence in the system. However, there is no perfect system. Right. And finally, the other Tony issue that they addressed had to do with whether or not they will re-exhibit the register if the audit is done. Mm -hmm. Well, the EC says that they will not be able to exhibit it in the manner that the NDC wants, i.e. going back to the over uh, 40,000 exhibition centers. Yes. However, they will make it available online for mm -hmm. voters to be able to check their details up to election day. So it means that it's not going to be physical, it's going to be virtual. And that's one of the issues they have been addressing. I, I see. And um, look, this, this gives what you have just done gives a comprehensive summary of this nine page response by the Electoral Commission to the NDC. And, and joining us on, a uh, on Zoom right now, Dr. Rashid Tanko Computer, Deputy Director of Elections and IT for the NDC. And then stay with me because there was one point that you make. And we're going to start off from the, the period that the PVR was made available to the parties. Let's go to the first slide, right? Because, Dr. Rashid Tanko, good evening. Thank you for, very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. 
Uh, good evening, Alfred. Uh, let me say good evening to your cherished viewers. The letter commission, in a response to you, and I'm sure you've received a copy of this nine-page response, they say that, yes, they admit that they did not make the provisional voters register available to you within a convenient time. But then again, even though they gave it to you late, all the parties, including the NDC, had enough time to scrutinize the register before the exhibition started. What time did you receive this provisional voters register from the EC before the exhibition started? Alfred, they gave us the provisional register on the 19th of September, 2024, barely 24 hours. In fact, it was 1 p.m. And it has to take threats from our national chairman, uh, my, my boss, Dr. Mani Boama. We issued threats and we were, we were ready to stop the exhibition exercise from coming on because we thought it was illegal. And then that, because we issued those threats, uh, they, they had no option than to release the provisional register to us. In fact, 1 p.m. on the 19th of September. 1 p.m., 19th September. And, 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 the, and the exercise yes. started on the 20th of September. So On the 20th. On the 20th. So that was the next day. So, so we, 1 we, p.m. We the day before. Yes. We, that is it. So we had to force and then, in fact, we didn't sleep uh, that night. We had to go through the register because we needed to make sure that these registers get to our constituencies and to our branches the following day before uh, the exhibition started because we wanted them to track it, track the, the exhibition at the polling station. So we worked overnight uh, to tease out all this uh, 16 uh, regional data and send it to the regions. And they also have to make sure that it goes to all the 276 constituencies. So it was a big headache they gave us uh, with this. I'm not surprised they had to uh, put it this way. They thought we couldn't have uh, uh, gotten the time to, to study the provisional register. That's why they did that, because they knew what they were doing. They knew that they had uh, manipulated the register and felt that if we give it to them at this last minute, they won't be able to, to go through all this uh, almost 18 million uh, 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 data that they had dumped uh, to us. So clearly, it, it, it was a stress on us. But I see. nonetheless, we, we want to rescue Ghana. So but There was a second demand that you made in that petition, which you've responded to. The over 243,000 illegal transfers as you captured in there. They say, you know, majority of it wasn't illegal and that the, the, these transfers were inadvertently done. And they added that 2020, 2021, 2022 transfers were inadvertently added. That's what amounted to the over 243,000 transfers as we saw it. Does that answer uh, the Alfred, concerns that you had? Alfred, this their uh, statement, the letter they've written to us, in fact, has vindicated our position all along. I mean, it has vindicated us in the eyes of Ghanaians that now they've come to agree and, 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 and admit that true, the NDC has issues that they needed to address. Uh, unlike our opponent who held press conference and was bastardizing us as if we had nothing to show, we were just making, making stories all along. The, the electoral committee has come to, I'm holding it here, they've come to admit to everything. Clearly, the electoral commission would told you publicly that when we came and met them on the 6th of September and left, we didn't give them any evidence of which they could work on and that they were waiting for us to bring evidence. And our opponents also latched on it and were all over the place. Today, they are using our evidence to write to us that, yes, we agree that the 243,000, if you hadn't given them evidence, where were they going to get the 243,000? They didn't identify it. Their IT system couldn't identify it. We were able to identify these 243,000 and, and made it very clear for them that, look, this transfer, we are not talking that they were illegal transfer. You see, they shouldn't set their own questions and answer it. We are saying that you have added an old data of transfers of 2023, which you did and migrated them to the register. You have brought it back again to this current 2024 register. By so doing, you have doubled the, 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 the register by this 243,000. That is illegal. It's not supposed to be there. The first time they came to rationalize it, they told us that it was deliberately added for us to track the transfer history. We told them that's not the case. That was their director of electoral service. And we told them that wasn't the case. 
It cannot be the case. We don't need it. In any case, if you are talking of transfer histories, then go and bring 1992 transfer, 96, 2000 and all that. That is not what we are looking for. I, I see. Then today, they have changed it to inadvertently. Have you seen that their, their, their statement? They said inadvertently included all transfers. Yes, and the that, 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 that's what's captured there. We, we have it on the screen. That is what, so, so you see what I'm talking about. That's why we say the chicken has come home to roast. So those who are saying that the NDC didn't have evidence and that the, the election commission, they were waiting for us. Now they are using our evidence to, to, to say that inadvertently added this. Well, in the so midst of all this, they say that their systems are robust, they, they, are, they are trustworthy, but then again, no system is perfect. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the point they make about the IT system at the commission. Alfred, in fact, one of the worst IT systems we've ever seen in this country is the Electoral Commission current IT system. Really? It's very shambolic. Look, let me tell you, that IT system is the root cause of all this problem we are going through. You have an IT system that could not be able to track this, to know that uh, the data I'm presenting now is an overbloated data. It's a data I've captured a data of 366,000 of transfers. Now I'm having a data reading 500 and something thousand, and you don't know that it has increased. And nobody in the department could track that this system that, uh, that has generated this number, there's something wrong with that. You have an IT system. Look, they've mentioned about 38 unauthorized transfers. It's lies. That was a teaser we gave them. The Electoral Commission has turned themselves to firefighting and fishing for information. So when we tease them by saying that they did some transfer in Tamale South and Sanargo and sent it to Pusiga, they quickly latched on that and came out with a press statement. And today, they repeated the same thing. Forgetting that you go to German North, similar is, incident is happening there. Asutifisa, similar incident. That is our origin. Then you come back to the same northern region, Tolong, similar incident has been uncovered. This illegal transfers. Then you go to Volta region. We have similar incidents. So they, it cannot be the 38. And so that's why I'm saying they have a, a shambolic IT system. Somebody sat in there and was able to manipulate their IT department, their system in there, and then started displacing voters. This one, we call it voter displacement. Voter displacement is like they have put you from one place to another. I see. By using the transfer window. And they were quoting from CI-91. Alfred, I want you to, to go to that aspect. Yes, CI-91 has nothing the, to do with transfer. Yes, the, the, the CI-91, specifically on, on voter transfer, they make reference to that, in, in fact. Yes, it's clearly, clearly, if you look at all their documents, they're 19 page. They're continuously quoting from CI-91. Why didn't they quote from CI-127? So that's what we have on the, so on the with, screen. With, it with says... Transfers. They said the CI-91 CI recognizes that there are bound to be discrepancies arising out of the registration exercise, which are ultimately yeah. reflected in the PVR. As such, Regulations 23 and 24 of CI-91 define clear pathways to correct these discrepancies before the final voters register is printed. Clearly, and I'm saying that they are setting their own question using the CI-91. Why haven't they quoted from CI-127, which has to do with transfers. Our issue with them is about the illegal transfers. It's not about somebody coming, his name is not properly spelled. It's not about somebody who came and they said, you, you are male, now they put female there. That's not the corrections we are talking about. We are talking of illegal transfers where voters have been displaced from one polling station to another in different constituencies. It has nothing to do with CI-91. So mm -hmm. they were cleverly tricking Ghanaians by issuing the CI-91 for you quoting copiously on it, just to uh, bamboozle Ghanaians that as if they were doing the right thing, but they ran away from CI 127, which has to do with about transfers. So why haven't they talked about it? All this illegal thing they did, they did it from this year. Right. This one, that's what they, 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 they try to hide from Ghanaians. And, and, and Dr. Tango, I'm going to end quickly with you on this. There was a final call that you made that this, uh, uh, the voters register, after these corrections are made, they should be, the PVR should be re-exhibited. The Electoral Commission says they are not opposed to any call for re-exhibition, but then again, it cannot be done physically. There would be an online re-exhibition, sort of, of the voters' register. Does that satisfy you? Alfred, these people, they don't learn from their mistakes. I don't know why they are, they are behaving that way. 
Look, we don't do electronic voting in Ghana. We don't also do electronic transmission of results in Ghana. Everything that we do is manual. That is why we do our exhibition manual. Manual exhibition. You come there because of our illiteracy rate. Look at our population. And you uh, compare that one to the literacy rate of this country. And you will see that majority, in fact, three quarters of our population are illiterate. So you go and do something electronic and expect them to go and check. How many of my, my, my relatives in the village can, can check electronic? I mean, we are just, you see, this thing is a policy direction. We are sending it to FEC as our, our functional executive committee headed by our national chairman, the next, uh, General Mosquito. We will discuss it and, and give them appropriate response. Look, initially, their director of electoral service came out and told us that they were not going to do any exhibition again. They won't do any real exhibition. But because they realized that at the end is that we have issues, the massive uh, manipulation of the register caused that there is a need to do another exhibition. Now, instead of them to go out and do the manual exhibition for people to see, they say they want to go electronic. Well, we will give them appropriate response on that. Right. But I'm telling you, Alfred, you and I know that the rural folks, how many of them can, can check electronic uh, to see their, their, their data and, 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 and respond appropriately? And as you so indicated... They, they, are doing, they are not learning from their, their, their mistakes. And they are just creating problems for themselves every day, day in, day out. We'll see how the coming days will look like. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Rashid Tanko Computer is Deputy Director of ITN Elections for the NDC. Clearly. A lot more questions for the Electoral Commission, at least on the part of the NDC. The answers don't satisfy well, the so, expectations. Well, so the crux of the EC statement is very simple. Mm -hmm. That their mandate to compile the voters' register as enshrined in the Constitution is not an event, it is a process. They think that with the issues that the NDC is raising, as legitimate as they may be, they can be resolved by the administrative and legal regime. And that is what the EC is saying on this particular matter. Well, Dennis Barberi Wadam, thank you very much for joining us as always. Uh, running through this more on 3news.com. Coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, some of the remanded protesters of Democracy Hub uh, head to the High Court seeking an order to quash the decision of the Circuit Court. We've got the details of this latest development for you on that uh, here on Ghana tonight. That's coming up next. We're getting to that specific detail of this next move by, by the leading members of this Democracy Hub. Now they're going in, into the, the High Court to essentially quash what has happened now um, at the Circuit Court. Stay with us. We'll give, we'll give you details of that one here on Ghana tonight. A, a leading member of the Democracy of Bolivar Bakavamao, uh, together with 12 other protesters who took part in the uh, demonstration against Galamse from September 21 to, to 23, have been remanded into police custody for two weeks. Uh, this three-day Stop Galamse Now demonstration was riddled with all the chaos that we have seen, leading to several arrests, which, which has since generated public uproar. Now, what you're seeing on the screen is Oliver Bakavamo in court earlier today. Um, also, together with uh, some 12 others uh, who are uh, or were in court earlier today to, as it were, uh, attend to the demands of the court. As we do know now, they've been remanded into police custody for some two weeks. What we know is that some have been remanded into prison custody others have been remanded into police custody as well. Now, looking at the numbers, it appears that we have close to over 50, 50 of these protesters who have been arraigned before court, based on the, the numbers so far that have appeared in, in court. And clearly tells you that the, the earlier 46 that we were talking about, they, they are more, as we see now. But Martin Pebble, private legal practitioner, he was in court earlier today, spoke to journalists after the court hearing. Take a look. I'm extremely shocked that the Leonard Child had remanded them. I'm shocked. This a case doesn't require a remand. The police didn't make a good case for a remand. And you see, you read Oko versus the Republic, the face of Tila J, you read the decision of Oko versus the Republic, they say, yes, the law is alive. In this particular case, what are witnessing for? I don't think a good case was made for a remand. As the judge himself uh, accepted, quite a number of the offenses. 
So that's uh, Martin Pebble, private legal practitioner there. What is happening now is that there was a decision. Uh, s some of the protesters who were remanded, including I'm a governor, so a private legal practitioner, have headed to the high court seeking to set aside the decision of the circuit court to remand them, as in deny them bail. Now, we have a copy of this motion and their relief that they are seeking. So that's the development with this right now. So if you see it, uh, this is it. This ex-persons who have gone to the high court for, with this application, Elom Ama Governor, Emmanuel Jan, Emmanuel Kobinado, Ziblim Yakubu, Oheniba Prempe, Philip Ousu Kobina, and also Von Kofi, Sadiq Yakubu. And the interested parties in this is the Attorney General and the Inspector General of Police. So essentially, they are seeking to, as it were, set aside the decision of the circuit court by going to the high court right now. And these are the reliefs that they are seeking. One, they want a declaration that the charge sheet over which the circuit court assume jurisdiction violates Article 19.2D of the Constitution and Section 122 of Act 30. Also, an order of Ceturare directed to the Circuit Court Accra to bring up to this Honorable Court, that's the High Court, to be quashed and the quashing of the order of the said Circuit Court dated September 24, 2024, remanding the applicants to police and prison custody. And finally, an order restraining the Ghana Police Service, the second interested party, or their agents, assigned workmen or workwomen, howsoever described or styled, from unlawfully detaining or continuing to detain the applicants. So that's what's happening right now and the latest to this uh, Democracy Hub uh, arrest. Now, uh, Christian Hesimaum is a private legal practitioner, human rights lawyer. He's joining us on Zoom. Uh, Council, appreciate you. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. And a number of groups have also issued statements now condemning essentially how th these, these protesters have been handled over the period. And now we are seeing what they've, they've done as well, uh, seeking to test the metal of the High Court on this development at the Circuit Court. I want to find out your take on this development. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, when it comes to arrest, it is balance of rights. Because um, our criminal jurisprudence has come a long way. And it is indeed to ensure that there is balance of rights you know, from the prosecution side and then with that of the suspect who later becomes an accused person. Indeed, with respect to these protesters, um, I must say that the police, again, under the combined um, criminal, um, um, the criminal act and also the constitution, um, Act 30, Act 29, and also the um, the Public Order Act. The police can effect arrest when it suspects that a crime is about being committed, is being committed, and will be committed. So, in the situation where um, a demonstration is happening, the police is in its security uh, is to gauge whether or not the certain elements among the protesters will go contrary to lay down rules and procedures, as in whether they will cause harm or cause public disorder. Now, by that alone, the police is vested to act. In situation where the police decides to arrest certain elements among the persons who have demonstrated or at the time were demonstrating would mean that the police will carry them through the lay down procedures of um, criminal proceedings by number one, detaining them within only 48 hours. Now, we have heard that some of them went beyond the 48 hours, especially the lady who. Um, it's not too well has a 
uh, diabetes has uh, uh, other complications as I, I heard and some others so that one is very unfortunate because once it goes beyond that then their fundamental human rights have been violated it becomes very unconstitutional it's against human rights now the police is expected to put those persons before court so they'll be arraigned before court again we've also heard that unfortunately a number of them could not assess counsel of choice now that situation also puts um, a suspect in a very grave situation so where that person is arraigned before court that person will not be able to articulate himself in fact the dynamics of court becomes very difficult for the person to understand because there will be the use of a lot of legalese. And such persons who are not, um, let me say, court rats. So court rats, basically on the late term is, maybe somebody might have attended court a lot of times who understand the court jargons and all of that. Someone too might not have done that, you know, and it becomes very difficult for that person understanding his or her way around. Now, there is also a different thing where the judge, in the absence of a lawyer, will seek to help a suspect to understand his or her rights. But it is everything necessary that where one is denied counsel, as in the situation which happened to some of the suspects, would cause grave injustice, even where the judge is trying to explain rules of court to the person because mentally that person is not there to understand the explanations being given. And you know the posture, sorry, and you know the posture, the posture of the prosecution definitely will be to detain. And once these persons are not or were not afforded counsel, the arguments will definitely be against them. Okay. And we found that some of them suffered this fate because the news reports gave all those details out. So um, the police cannot absorb themselves. They cannot absorb themselves completely of um, any blame. Um, I pray that they need to be more friendly with the public. It does not mean that... We when one goes contrary to the rules, um, that person should not be punished. But that person should be walked within the confines of the law. Okay. And again, bail, as we are as we are well aware, all matters are available unless the court has reason to detain you. So when one is denied counsel, who would either to argue on behalf of that person in another way means that that person's bill has been overreached. That person will not be able to assess that because that person will not be able to articulate how he or she um, can cooperate with the police and other grounds expected for that person to canvass um, the grounds of the bill. Right. So I think these little or would say flaws that we witnessed with how the right. police um, dealt with the protesters is, is, is why certain portions of the public and even some lawyers are not happy. In, 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 indeed, and you talk about the sections of the public and organizations and lawyers who, who have expressed concern about how things have played out over the last um, uh, 72 hours and over. The Amnesty International, the latest, they're also speaking about this. They make the point and requesting, in fact, they are requesting a list of all detained protesters. And today, per, per the mathematics we've done, we're getting to know that over 50 of them are actually been either detained in police or prison custody. And they're demanding the full list where they are stationed so they can be granted access to them and also receive the necessary care and basic human rights. They are also appealing that all who were unlawfully arrested be compensated according to the law of Ghana. You know, there are some persons who say they were just passerbys and, and, and they were picked up. 
Also, they're asking an independent investigation on this matter be immediately conducted and actions taken to ensure that such injustice and inhuman treatment to citizens of the Republic of Ghana does not happen again. And also aligning with that position, and, and Council, I'll take this finally and quick one for, from you, whether this, per what you have seen and what has been playing out, you align with those who say that the approach appears to be high-handed and, and quite, you know, unnecessary for that matter. I tend to, I tend to lean towards um, what some of our colleagues um, um, lawyers have said, and, and um, having heard from some of them who are representing some of these um, um, persons, it's, it's quite difficult. I mean, the sad thing is if you want to assess your clients and you are told that you cannot. I mean, in this day and age, we have gone past those things. In this day and age, once a lawyer appears before a station, it should not be ordered from above. You can't see that person. We've gone past this. We are in a rule-based order. We are in a rule-based order where rule of law is the order of the day. In the same way, the police is seeking to um, carry through with what it, it believes that are the rules of the land. It, it, it's inherently that which gives right to those suspects to also uphold their rights. So why would one inherently seek to enforce the law and at the same time um, shed off one who is also seeking to uphold his that same right um, stemming out from the bundle of rights that everybody is is holding right. up to? It well, becomes an injustice. Council, appreciate you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. Uh, Christian Mam Hesse is private legal practitioner. Have a nice take on this. In fact, the CDD, Center for Democratic Development, Ghana, also issued a statement on this, condemning a number of things. Let's say uh, the following actions, they condemn the unnecessary manhandling and brutality of the citizens exercising their civic and political rights to protest also, the refusal by the police to release the complete list of the arrested individuals, they, say they condemn that, and the ongoing denial of access to legal counsel for detainees in direction, that's in direct violation of Article 14.2 of the 92 Constitution, underscores the situation's urgency, the failure to notify lawyers of the detained individuals before their arraignment before the circuit court. The police indicate that in, in their defense, they say also that all of these things never happened, that they did not deny this person's legal counsel. The police has not been also giving de some details on this. We're knocking on their doors to see what happens next. Also, they said the unlawful transfer of detainees from police cells to prison without court approval, CDD condemns that, and the prolonged detention of protesters beyond 48 hours without being brought before a competent court violates Article 14.3 of the 1992 Constitution, and the list goes on and on. And finally, they make the point that they condemn the continuing denial of access for family members to meet with their detained relatives. Recall that the reason why these persons, the democracy have protesters, were on the streets, were protesting the impact of illegal mining, Galam Singh which we're all confronted with on many fronts. That leads us to our Young Voters' Voices segment for tonight. This matter of Galamse is not only an environmental issue, it's a social matter, it's an economic matter, it's a political issue as well. So we put the microphones to some young voters who have a vote on December 7, and this is what they have to say. Illegal mining is one of the biggest conversations happening in the country now. And during Media General's thought leadership program, we found out from some Gen Z's their thoughts and the solutions that we can implore to tackle the issue of Galamse and illegal mining in the country. Today, they added their pledge to it. Each and every one of them pledged their allegiance to how they can also solve or contribute to the solutions. I think the president is the leader of the country, okay? And then 
what I know is he is the commander in chief of the army too. So if a president is a commander in chief of the army, then he can stand in for the citizens. He can stand in and say, no, stop Galancy, because then our water bodies are polluted, the forests are damaged. The forest is a source of income, like because then it's like a tourist site. People come from different countries as well. So if he is able to stand on his feet and say, no, stop Galancy, I think everything will be okay. And then as an individual, as the protest is going on, I would like to join. Yes, because as we are talking, our voices are being heard. Whether they are taking it into consideration or not, we are still talking. It's due to lack of jobs or due to unemployment that Galamse is ongoing, illegal mining. So if the government is able to provide adequate jobs or there are more employment for the youth, I think this Galamse would stop. I think the government has to do something urgent like right now because it's affecting everybody, like everybody in the country. And then my biggest fear is that since everyone is trying to come together to fight this, so would the teachers also try to come inside because, though I think they will do that because we are all humans and it's affecting all of us. But what, what do you think? What do you think they should do? Yeah, so I think the government has to do something like, okay. yes, any, any measures to, that he can put in place to fight this because I think they are not doing anything urgent. My voice can be heard that loud. Mm -hmm. So maybe starting it a bit for maybe my WhatsApp status so that they will also at least forward it to other people and then my, the various groups I am on and then things so that Oh, there you have it. Um, employing other means of spreading the news as well. And that, those are the young voters. They have a voice, they have a vote, they have an opinion, and we give it to them here on Ghana Tonight on your election command center.